filled with angels who speak and shout your name. The atmosphere is changing as eternity invades. And suddenly. with beauty eye to eye with love standing with the elders we will throw our crowns at the feet of Jesus as we shout blessing and honor Lord With all these fiery darts and they will not stop, I can feel them 
release their poison. Not your home alone. 
Thank you for loving us and correcting us, setting us straight upon the path that you have for us, Lord, that your will will be done, that would be for your glory, Lord, and for our good. Lord, please minister to us tonight. Let us be moldable like that clay. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's all say hello to one another.
the attention be on you tonight I pray Jesus. Amen. All right, we're in Ezekiel chapter 40. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 40. Yes, that's where we are. As the sign says, silence your phones. Yes. Turn off your cell phone. If you have to leave the sanctuary, stay out there. You know all the routine, everything. Well, it's good to be back here, I'll tell you that. Well, <laughs> well, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace upon our lives. And thank you, God, for your, your truth of your word, Lord. We live in a world where, God, you know, all we get are lies from the government, from the news, from advertising, Lord, you know, all the way down the line, God. Thank you that we can come in here, we can open your word, Father. The, the, the foundation, the pillar of truth, Lord, here that we have and study it so that, Lord, we can have a lens, we can have a filter through which to look at this world this culture that we're living in god we just pray for our country lord it's just spiraling out of control god i pray that all the church would rise up and just serve you pray lord diligently and intercede for our nation right now god 
And Father, I ask that you bless your word as it goes forth tonight. I pray your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and our instructor. Open it to our understanding, God, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, Ezekiel 40. Ezekiel writes, In the 25th year of our captivity, at the beginning of the year on the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year after the city was captured, on the very same day the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me there. In the visions of God, he took me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain. On it toward the south was something like the structure of a city. He took me there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze. He had a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand, and he stood in the gateway. The man said to me, Son of man, look with your eyes, hear with your ears, fix your mind on everything I show you, for you were brought here so that I might show them to you, declare to the house of Israel everything you see. And there was a wall around the outside of the temple, and the man's hand a measuring rod six cubits long, each being a cubit and a handbreadth. And he measured the width of the wall structure one rod and the height one rod. Now, if you're really into architecture, tonight is your night, because <laughs> we go through this, man, there's going to be a lot of measuring and things, but... With these last nine chapters of Ezekiel, we're taken with the prophet Ezekiel not only geographically back to the city of Jerusalem, but we're taken dimensionally to a time yet future to us, to what is called here in the Old Testament the Kingdom Age. In the book of Revelation, it's revealed that the Kingdom Age lasts a thousand years. And so it's called by some the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, the kingdom age, the messianic kingdom, the future time when the promised Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ, will be ruling and reigning on this earth. Can't wait. Come quickly, Jesus. But the majority of the information regarding that coming age is revealed right here in the Old Testament. And it's such as here, we see I have nine chapters where he's going to measure the whole area where worship is going to be going on and, and in detail describe what happens there and the, and the whole area there. But the, new, the kingdom age is the, the high point of the Old Testament. The only new information regarding the kingdom age is its length there in the New Testament. But the thousand-year kingdom age will be the final age within this present creation, this physical creation, after which this physical universe will be done away with. Revelation 20 says, and a new heaven and a new earth will be brought into being, according to Revelation 21, with a new Jerusalem. It will be an amazing thing to experience, and perhaps during the thousand-year reign of this thousand-year kingdom age, further insight will be given into that coming time. We know from Ephesians chapter 2 that there are ages to come after this, you know, physical universe is done away with. So this prophecy here over the next nine chapters deals with the Jerusalem that will be central to all that takes place during this thousand-year kingdom age when Jesus is ruling. This, along with other Old Testament scriptures, provides a lot of information with regards to what awaits, but... I'm sure it doesn't even come close to, you know, what we're going to see, what we're going to experience. It's like, you know, you see this beautiful sunrise, you know, and man, it's just gorgeous. You take your iPhone out and you take this picture of this glorious scene and just taking your breath away and you can't wait to show it, you know, to your friend. You see him. You got to see this sunset I experienced. You pull it up and there it's about the size of a BB on a little phone. You know, look, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Yeah, dude, that's pretty cool. Two inches sun, sunset, you know, must have been awesome. But I'm sure it's the same thing here. You know, we, there's only so much that, you know, we can have on, in God's word. It's not going to, you know, be able to describe the full impact. It's going to be realized when we're there. As prophecy begins with this detailed time frame, the 25th year of our captivity, the beginning of the year and the 10th day of the month. 14th year after the city was captured. So this description puts the date of this prophecy at 575 B.C. So we're studying a document roughly 2,586 years old. A good way to spend a Friday night. 
in compiling the information given thus far in the book here of Ezekiel from chapter 1 to chapter 33. Ezekiel was 50, year old, 50 years old when he receives this vision. He had been a prophet for 25 years. It had been 14 years by that time when he has this vision since the complete demolish, demolition of the city of Jerusalem. The tenth day of the first month of the year, the hand of the Lord was upon Ezekiel. In other words, he was in a spiritual state that was brought upon him by the Lord for the purpose of taking him there, it says. Speaking of Jerusalem, but yet in such a transfigured state, it's simply there. And he says in verse 2, In the visions of God he took me into the land of Israel, set me on a very high mountain. So while the vision, in this vision state, Ezekiel is taken to the land of Israel, so while the whole topography of the land is changed, as we'll see, totally reconfigured, the land of Israel is still in the same geographical location here on planet Earth during this kingdom age. The structure of the land had been radically changed. Very high mountain. Yeah, if you've ever been to Israel, there's no, it's what they call mountains, but you know they're not the Rockies or the Alps or anything like that. They're just big hills. But this is this guy's a very high mountain there in Israel with a city on top of the southern part of the top of this mountain. This transformed Jerusalem, it's depicted elsewhere in the Old Testament. If you turn to Isaiah chapter 2, go left in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 2. So just a couple cross-references. There's several we could go to. But you get kind of the idea here. Isaiah 2, verse 1, The word that Isaiah, son of Amaz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. So in other words, it's going to be above all the mountains where the Lord's house is. So what we're going to be seeing described in Ezekiel is on top of higher than all the other mountains, be exalted above the hills. All nations, it says, shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war again. Now turn to Isaiah chapter 25. Chapter 25 of Isaiah is a passage within a larger portion of prophetic scripture. We pick up at verse 6 of Isaiah 25. And in this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, well-refined wine on the lees describing great festival, great feast, and he will destroy on this mountain the surf, the surface of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. That's describing a breaking through of the spiritual realm into the physical realm. He will swallow up death forever. The Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it shall be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For on this mountain, the hand of the Lord will rest. Moab shall be trampled down under him, as straw trampled down from a refuse heap. He will spread out his hands in their midst as a swimmer reaches to swim, and he will bring down their pride, together with the trickery of their hands, the fortress of the high fort of your walls he will bring down lay low bring to the ground down to the dust so god is going to begin to reign upon this earth there's other passages but let's turn back to ezekiel now ezekiel 40 
in the vision, verse 3, says that Ezekiel meets a man on the top of this mountain where this city is, whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze or shining brass, literally. This man is holding two measuring devices, verse 3 says. He had a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand and stood in the gateway. A line of flax was a, a longer measuring device used for longer spans and more like a tape measure. The measuring rod would be like a long yardstick. We're going to see this one he has is about 10 feet long. So Ezekiel's going to be observing some measuring, as we'll see, actually 318 precise measurements using about 37 specific words that are, it's, that are common to ancient architectural descriptions, doorposts, gates, windows, porches. The vision, verse 4 says here, has a greater purpose in just receiving dimensions of a future temple. The man says to him in verse 4, Son of man, look with your eyes, hear with your ears, fix your mind on everything I show you, for you were brought here so that I might show them to you. Declare to the house of Israel everything you see. And you put this in the context of the book here, in the context of Ezekiel's prophetic ministry. About 13 years prior to this, chapter 33, Ezekiel was recommissioned as a prophet to the nation of Israel. He was called as a watchman a second time. And there's a turning point that takes place with chapter 33. The content of the prophecies change at that point. From prophecies of judgment prior to that to prophetic words of promise and encouragement after that point. And this prophetic vision here would definitely serve to encourage those in Ezekiel's day. They're sitting in a prison of war camp in Babylon. They are prisoners of war in a foreign country. The Jews were reaping the consequences of their sins to the point that everything in that day would appear hopeless. Their whole city was demolished. Their temple was demolished. The temple in Jerusalem, Jerusalem signified Israel's relationship with God. It's where the people would meet with him to have their destroyed, you know, to have their temple destroyed in their minds meant that their relationship with God was destroyed. Their relationship with God was gone forever. So to now be given this incredible vision, you know, this is what awaits. Everything's not lost. This vision of a future temple with a future inheritance awaiting them as a nation, as we'll see, this would cultivate great hope among not just the people of that time, but you wonder, you know, how have the Jews survived over all these, you know, thousands of years, you know, centuries? Well, this is how. They know what is awaiting them. So not just the people in that day, but when the Jews are going through horrendous persecution over the years. This is their scriptures. You know, we're coming to it. We'll, be, we'll have a, definitely a large part in this as the church, which is amazing. But the Jews, they, they have all these prophetic scriptures, and they know what awaits for them in their future, and they are looking forward to it. And believe me, the rabbis of today know these things are on the horizon. Ezekiel here, he meets this man who's standing there ready to do some measuring. And Ezekiel is told in verse 4 to look here and fix your mind upon everything that's shown. A threefold command emphasizing the importance of this. Not just for his own personal benefit, but he's brought here to declare these things to the house of Israel. Everything he sees. Now verse 5 says there was a wall all around the outside of the temple. In the man's hand was a measuring rod six cubits long, each being a cubit and a hand breadth. And he measured the width of the wall structure, one rod, and the height, one rod. So what we're going to see in these ensuing chapters is a detailed description of the dimensions and all the goings-on in this future temple, which is going to exist during the thousand-year kingdom age here on earth having a more a fu a fuller revelation as we do through the New Testament. And the indication is when you compile prophetic scripture, there's going to be a third temple 
on the current site of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem right now, sometime in the near future. We were just on the Temple Mount in March, We've been on there twice. It's a huge platform area. It's nothing like what's going to be described here. But according to Scripture, you know, everything, you know, is good. There's going to be an, uh, another temple built there. And everything is currently in place. All the temple instruments, you go to a, a place called the Temple Institute Museum, you can see the menorah, the table of showbread. Everything is there. They have uh, the priesthood. They're called the Kohanim who trace their DNA back to the line of Aaron. They have a red heifer. Everything needed, all they need is a green light to build, and the temple that will be up, it will be operational like almost immediately. And it's during, in that temple that, you know, it's going to be in existence during the seven-year tribulation period. Now, I don't know how much you watch the news, but there's a lot of activity going on besides just, you know, the things going on with, you know, Taylor Swift and everything else. There's a lot more things going on in this world, especially in the Middle East. And the thing to watch is what is happening between Israel and Saudi Arabia right now. This is a historic situation. And this just came out today, and it shows you how, you know, these things, this is why if you, in the Bible prophecy, you watch this, you go, dude, this is very interesting. There's a Jordanian analyst. I can barely describe his name, Ora Ib al Rintawi. Okay, he's a George from the country of Jordan, director of their uh, political studies at their university, and he was interviewed for the, the media there in Jordan, and he has fears that the parties involved, right now there is this big push for Saudi Arabia and Israel to forge a peace agreement. Our government is totally pushing this. It began with Donald Trump, but right now, you know, Joe Biden is all involved in this, and they're forging this agreement, and it looks like it could very well take place. Israel's made political agreements with other uh, Arab nations. This is historical. All these nations were at war with them at one time. But this guy said, it seems that Jordan is being left out of the loop. They're not, Jordan is not aware of what is happening between Saudi Arabia and Israel. You see, Jordan is significant because they, are, they administrate the Temple Mount. It is under their control. The, the Jordanian you know, uh, government controls that port, portion of Israel. It's, one, it's called the third holiest site in Islam. But Jordan is feeling left out of this deal that's going on. It reminds us, he says, of what happened under the Trump administration and what was called the deal of the century at that time, which was accomplished and prepared without Jordan's knowledge. He explains that Jordan's concern stems from the fact that it is kept in the dark, especially on the Palestinian issue that is vital to it. Rintawi says, the Saudi says that Saudi Arabia is sending contradictory messages regarding the Palestinians. Saudi Arabia wants to deal with Israel because it's financially profitable for them. The, the Palestinians aren't. But its foreign minister emphasized at the speech at the UN in their meetings last week that you know, the Arab Peace Initiative, this two-state agreement with East Jerusalem as its capital, he said, oh, that's still on the table, but leaks are coming out saying things to the contrary, this uh, Jordanian uh, uh, analyst says. The Hasmonite kingdom, they're a kingdom, the king, the king of Jordan, they're, they're king, they are the custodians of Jerusalem's holy sites and maintaining supervision over them provides King Abdullah of Jordan the political legitimacy that he needs to rule. So in other words, he's got all his power because of the Temple Mount, basically. Some in Jordan fear that the Crown Prince Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, the guy with the long you know, uh, robe and everything, He's, he's going to take over his father's position. There's the Jordan fears he is ambition, he's ambitious, and once he ascends to the throne, he has his eyes on replacing the king of Jordan as custodian of the third most holy place in Islam, the Temple Mount. And so 
between the Arabs, they believe that this guy who is forging this peace agreement, he has eyes on becoming the one who's going to be overseeing the Temple Mount. Now again, it's a very significant move because once some kind of peace goes in, and it says in Daniel chapter 9 that the Jews are going to make some kind of a covenant for seven years. And many believe it's going to be a covenant that says, we'll make peace, you build your temple, and these things will take place. So keep your eye on that. But according to the Bible, according to Daniel 9, Matthew 24, 2 Thessalonians 2, there will be a temple in the seven-year tribulation period. At the middle of the tribulation period, the abomination of desolation will take place when the coming Antichrist will go into the Holy of Holies and demand to be worshipped. We're not told specifically what happens to that temple, this temple that's going to be built. But we are told in several places, such as Revelation 16, Zechariah 14, that Jerusalem is going to undergo a massive earthquake. This is what's going to push this mountain up. It's going to split the Temple Mount in two. So obviously when that happens, that temple's going to be gone. So this will be, this, what we're seeing here, what he starts measuring is really a fourth temple. Now the question is, as you read this, why is there a need for a temple anyway? Seeing as the need for sacrificial atonement has been done away with once and for all through the cross of Jesus Christ. Why do they need a temple with sacrifice? The fact that it is what makes, you know, any modern day temple, you know, that they're going to set up to worship in, it's going to be, you know, not just unnecessary, but blasphemous. And it's understandable why that will be annihilated. But why build a temple here in the kingdom age in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ? We come to this temple, is measured here, it's humongous. It wouldn't fit on the current temple mount. But why will there be a, te a temple complete with a priesthood sacrifices in the coming thousand year reign? Many Bible scholars believe this temple that we're going to be seeing measured here. It will exist there in the kingdom age, will serve as some kind of a memorial or a place of instruction. As we just saw in Isaiah chapter 2, you can see it in Micah chapter 4, other places, people who will be coming to this place during the kingdom age are seen streaming into this holy mountain, saying, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. So they're not going to know anything from this current age we're living in. It's all going to be new. So there will be instruction of some sort taking place there on this holy mountain. You accumulate all the information that we have in the Bible regarding that future kingdom age. We know that there will be believing saints from the Old Testament, Abraham, David, Isaiah, all the Old Testament saints, as well as church-age saints, such as us, if you are born again, along with what are called tribulation saints. You see them in the book of Revelation. They get saved after the rapture, probably one of the greatest times of people getting saved ever, right there at the beginning of the tribulation period. All three categories of saints, Old Testament, New Testament, tribulation saints, will receive glorified, resurrected bodies by the beginning of the kingdom age. We, the church, will receive ours at the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, in the twinkling of an eye. We're special to the Lord because unlike tribulation saints, unlike Old Testament saints, you know, we are following the Messiah now. But others will receive, the Old Testament saints, the tribulation saints will receive glorified bodies as what, at what is called the first resurrection, Revelation 20, verse 5. All glorified saints will serve in some capacity during the coming thousand-year reign in glorified bodies. Bodies like Jesus had when he rose from the dead. Now, after the battle of Armageddon here on earth, Jesus will gather the survivors of this worldwide cataclysms that you read about in the book of Revelation and you read about in the Old Testament. That's going to take place the seven-year tribulation period. Probably not too many people left, but there will be thousands. I don't know. But after the battle of Armageddon, 
the survivors of these cataclysms of the seven-year tribulation period, they will be people in physical bodies like we have right now. They will be gathered outside of Jerusalem, the Bible says, and Jesus will determine who will enter his kingdom and who won't. There will be Jews and there will be Gentiles. According to Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 31, the Olivet Discourse, he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. They will gather together his elect, the Jews, from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And according to chapter 34 of this book, if you were here, otherwise go back and read it, Jesus will also judge amongst the Jews then who are there, and those found worthy will enter into the kingdom as a born-again nation, Israel, will enter in as born-again people. All subsequent Jews born during the thousand-year reign will be saved, according to Romans chapter 11, verse 26. The Gentiles will be gathered and judged in what is called the judgment of the sheep and the goats. Matthew 25, Joel chapter 3. Those that survive that judgment, Jesus will say, enter into the, the, the blessing of the Lord. And the others will be told to re depart. But they will receive Jesus Christ. Those who enter in will also receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior as they enter the kingdom age, not in glorified bodies, but they will be born again. They'll be regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Everybody entering into the kingdom age will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And they will repopulate, these people will repopulate this transformed earth. And they will, you know, just as after the flood, you think of the flood in Genesis chapter 9, as a whole new order was established with Noah and his family, eight people as they stepped out onto a radically transformed earth. This was totally different. New rules were given for a new relationship with God through the Noahic covenant. Noah and his family come out a profound change in the structure of the earth physically, spiritually, and the way everything was ordered. Thousands of years later, to us, it's just what is normal. To them, it was all brand new, but this, you know, we go to the Grand Canyon and we see it, yeah, there was a flood, you know, but to them, this was totally new. The next cataclysmic upheaval, you read Revelation, it's going to be just as transforming, even more so, both physically and spiritually. And it's during the coming kingdom age on a radically different earth where Jesus is reigning, Satan is bound, people will be being born in physical bodies, you know, in not having experienced the world before the Lord's return. They won't know what the world was like before the, the, the kingdom age started. Being in physical bodies, they will still have a sin nature. They just won't have any ability to sin without consequences. Satan will be bound. There won't be liquor stores and porn shops and things like that in, the, in Jesus' kingdom age. But so people will not be allowed to, they'll be enforced righteousness. They will, but they will need to be taught regarding God's mercy, his grace. They will be required to believe in and receive Jesus Christ by grace through faith so as to be given the right to become children of God. As John's Gospel, verse, chapter 1, verse 12 says. So as people are being born, according to Isaiah 65, that decision will take place before they reach 100 years old. For no one will die until they're 100 years old, Isaiah 65, 20. But the sinner, being 100 years old, shall be cursed. So they'll be subject to physical death, in other words. Now, eventually, during the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ... The, the age of 100 will be the normal age. It will be the age of accountability, according to Isaiah 65. There will be little, if any, recollection of what we live in right now, of this present age, just as we know very little of what took place before the flood. We have a couple chapters in Genesis. All we know is it was very wicked. There was a lot of people, and they were very wicked. That's all... And that's all they'll have to say about this age. A very wicked time. God had to destroy the earth again. 
By the end of the thousand year reign, Revelation 20 says the earth will be repopulated with so many people that those capable of being deceived when Satan is released, people able to be deceived will be as a multitude as numerous as the sand in the seashore, Revelation 20 verse 8. And the kingdom age will come to an end and the thousand year you know, reign of Christ will then wrap up and will move into what's called the eternal order. But that kingdom age will be totally different time here on earth. And what is being measured here, we move into this, just an introduction there for you, but what's being measured here will serve as some type of instructive model, something like that. It doesn't say. It will not serve in any capacity like ancient temples for any kind of, you know, atonement. And we'll see the differences as you go along. So there was a wall around the outside of the temple, verse 5 says, and the man's hand was a measuring rod, six cubits long, being a cubit and a hand breadth. Now the word temple is literally house. So this is the house of the Lord. He doesn't measure the city until later. This is strictly the future temple complex where this worship will take place with him measuring the wall first. The measuring rod is six cubits long and a hand breadth, verse 5 says. A cubit eight is 18 inches. A hand breadth is another approximately three inches. So the cubit used was 21 inches. Six of those make up a rod that's being used here. So his rod's about 10 and a half feet long. Now try and convert this into feet as we go through because he uses you know, different measuring. The thickness of the wall was ten and a half feet thick. The height of the wall, ten and a half feet. He moves towards toward the wall, and the first thing is shown is an eastern gate in verse 6. He went to the gateway which faced east, and he went up the stairs, measured the threshold of the gateway, which was one rod wide, one rod ten and a half feet. The other threshold was one rod wide, ten and a half feet. So the eastern gate is like the main entrance. And we'll show a short video here in a little bit. But the steps leading up to the gate aren't numbered here, but in verses 22 and 26, there's seven steps. There's a threshold or a porch. Ten and a half feet square is what's described in verse 6. The gate, it's not like a gate in a fence. This gate is actually a huge enclosure leading into the temple courtyard. We'll see that there's three of these coming into this wall. Ezekiel is led up to the porch. This man's measuring everything. The gate ends up being a long hallway with compartments as you go through it, compartments on either side. In order to give, get the picture, you'll have to walk through this long gate by referring to the appropriate verses so there won't be consecutive. But drop down to verse 15 at this point. Verse 15 says, From the front of the entrance, so as he walks in, from the front of the entrance gate to the front of the vestibule, as you go through this whole gateway, is 50 cubits. Now 50 cubits is 87 and a half feet long. So the entrance, this gateway, is 87 and a half feet long as you go down like a hallway to what's called the vestibule. The vestibule we'll see is like a foyer just before you enter into the courtyard of the temple area. But first, the width of this long hallway is verse 11. He measured the width of the entrance to the gateway, 10 cubits, and the length of the gate, 13 cubits. So 17 and a half feet wide as you proceed into this long hallway. Back in verse 7, there are gate chambers, these booths or rooms that are on either side. Verse 7 says, each gate chamber was one rod long, one rod wide. So ten and a half feet between the gate chambers was a space of five cubits. And the threshold of the gateway by the vestibule inside gate was one rod. And so you enter this gate, this long hallway leads to the actual temple courtyard. All along the hallway are these chambers. It could be that in some of some version, Bible versions call them guard houses whether they'll have guards in there. Others believe they're like greeting areas where people will be greeting visitors as they come to worship or enter into this area, hand out materials. It doesn't say. 
but there's also gate posts or pillars along the inside, verse 10 says. And you look at verse 12, and verse 12 says there was a space in front of the gate chambers. So as you go in, there's six, there's three gate chambers on each side, and there's a little space in front of them, one cubit. So it's like 18 inches or so, where, you know, it's kind of set back. It's a 21-inch space, actually, in front of each chamber, which would probably en enable people to interact without stopping the flow of people entering the temple there in Jerusalem. Now, seen in these other scriptures, there's eventually going to be streams of people coming into this temple complex. So some kind of space is in front of each chamber. You get to the end of this long hallway the, of this entrance gate. You come to what verse 7 calls the threshold of the gateway by the vestibule of the inside gate. So this is a foyer area just before you enter into the courtyard. At the end of this long hallway, probably people ushering you in, however it will be, just before you enter where the temple's going to be. The inside of the vestibule has an opening of ten and a half feet. And it says at the end of verse 7, that by the vestibule and the inside gate was one rod. He also measured the vestibule of the inside gate one rod. And he measured the vestibule of the gateway eight cubits and the gate post two cubits. The vestibule of the gate was on the inside. And so the length this foyer is about 14 feet deep. And then you exit the vestibule at the end of a long hallway. And you come out into a courtyard. You turn around. So you're now you're in the courtyard. And, and you're looking back at the gate post that verse 9 talks about. There are two gate posts. The gate posts, two cubits, the vestibule of the gate was on the inside. And so gate posts, we'll see later on, they have palm trees on them. But it says then that, so it, it's, believe me, this isn't the easiest passage to go through because it's not consecutive. But so far, we've just come through the gateway. You pick up at verse 16 now. It says that in that gateway, there's beveled windows the window frames and the gate chambers and the intervening archway. So this long hallway, it's not dark. It's not some dark tunnel. There's windows in it and there's archways incorporated into it all around. And there are windows all around on the inside and on each gate post are palm trees. So not some just long dark thing. It's very bright. Very detailed vision Ezekiel is being given. He's not, he's given this tour of this future temple compound, as it turns out to be. Having come through the gate, he enters the courtyard called, called the outer courtyard in verse 17. He brought me into the outer courtyard, and there were chambers and a pavement made all around the court. Thirty chambers faced the pavement. So all the way around, there's an inside courtyard, Kind of a big expanse area having a large pavement called the outer court and there is all these rooms 30 of them all the way around on the inside of this thing all facing into this courtyard what they do in these rooms it doesn't say either but this outer court or large this large pavement is what the the gateways coming in through the wall enter into verse 18 says and as Ezekiel would look across, as he would enter in, and he would look across from where, where he entered in, this outer courtyard, from that gateway across the outer courtyard, there would be the actual temple area. So there's a large, you know, expanse. You go about 175 feet, and then there's a wall that has the temple inside of it. Verses 20 through 23 describe a northern gateway. I won't read the whole thing because it's exactly like the Eastern Gateway. The Southern Gateway, verses 24 through 27, it gives the exact same description, and you can read it and, you know, see for yourself. It's this, the, these three gates, all the same size. They're very tall as well. It says, you know, that they're, you know, they're about, I don't know, 100 feet tall, something like that. But all three gateways are identical. Now, at verse 28, Ezekiel is taken from the outer court that he had just entered into from the eastern gate, and he's brought into the inner area where the main temple building is. 
So Ezekiel comes up this large mountain, and here is this huge walled temple complex. He enters through the eastern gate, down this long hallway, chambers on either side of them as he comes in, into a vestibule or foyer area at the end of this hallway, and then out into the courtyard called the outer court, because once inside he finds a smaller walled area, the inner court. And Ezekiel enters that through a southern gateway with, into what's called the inner court, verse 28. It says, He brought me to the inner court through the southern gateway, measured the southern gateway according to the same measurements. Also its gate chambers, its gate posts, archways were all according to the same ones on the outer wall. There's an inner wall with these gateways as well that go into it. In verse 32, he brought me into the inner court facing east. He measured the gateway according to these same measurements. All its gate chambers, its gate posts, its archways were according to the same measurements that were given when he walked into through the outer wall. 50 cubits long, 25 cubits wide. Its archways faced the outer court, palm trees on everything brought me to the north gateway same thing verse 35 it's the same measurement also the gate chambers the gates posts archways so he just gives the exact same description as he looks around at everything there and there was a chamber in its entrance gate posts that were where verse 38 says uh, there was a chamber of, or a room and its entrance by the gate posts of the gateway where they washed the burnt offering so here there it's like they, he turns around and he sees this room where they're preparing sacrifices, washing dead carcasses. So it's taken into this butchering area. He goes back in and he sees that in this, this area there is two tables on this side, two tables on the other side. This is where they're preparing offerings. So this is all leading into where the actual temple is. And at the outer court of the vestibule, as one goes up to the entrance, verse 40 of the northern gateway, there's two tables, and one on each side, the vestibule, the gateway, were these two tables. So there's four tables on either side and eight tables all together where they're slaughtering the sacrifices. So you think there's, you know, butchering chickens is bad, you know. <laughs> This would be pretty gnarly. There were also four tables of hewn stone, verse 42. And on these they laid the instruments, so all the butchering instruments. Inside were hooks, a hand breadth wide, fastened all around, so where they would hang the carcasses. Outside the inner gate were the chambers where singers, so these rooms where singers were residing in. One facing south, the other north gateway. And then he said in verse 45, this chamber which faces south is for the priests who have charge of the temple. So that's an area where they're either eating or they're just resting or they're preparing to serve. The chamber which faces north is for the priests who have charge of the altar. They're the sons of Zadok from the sons of Levi. Verse 46 says, who come near to the Lord to minister to him. And he measured the court, 100 cubits long, 100 cubits wide, four square. And the altar was in front of the temple. So a large courtyard just right in front of the temple doors with a big altar in front of it. And he brings him right up into the temple itself, the vestibule of the temple, and measured that, the foyer of the temple, the doorposts, five cubits on this side, five cubits on that, and the width of the gateway. And the length of this vestibule, it was 20 cubits deep, the width 11 cubits, and there were pillars on either side. So that's a lot of information that you're just going, dude, I can't com conceptualize this at all, okay? <laughs> this whole picture is of people ascending upward higher and higher while entering in deeper and deeper into where our Lord's going to be seated. One day we'll enter into one of these gateways. Now, I've asked these guys to pull up this video so you get a better view of it, and that's how we'll end this. But you're just thinking one day, as you see what is going to be depicted here, you know, we might bump into one another and say, dude, you remember when Pastor Jeff tried to explain this and it was like totally confusing? <laughs> now I get it, okay. 
So to visualize this short video, this is pretty clean. They don't have the dead animals everywhere. So, you know, you have to picture that part yourself, but you'll get the idea. You can get it on the internet, so not like it's only here. Um. <clears throat> Ta -da. There, there is sound to it too, I guess. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah pretty cool song actually <laughs> so here's a wall it comes up is the entrance to the long gate 